Hey everybody, I am here in Hollywood, California, joined once again by Brian Cometa of $300 Data Recovery. And today I'm hoping that uh, you can answer a bunch of questions about uh, data recovery and the common misconceptions and myths and get all that straightened out. And then maybe show me what's new in the last couple of years in data recovery. Perfect. Right on. Let's go. Hi, my name is Brian Cometa, and I'm the owner and lead technician at $300 Data Recovery. We opened in 2007. Uh, prior to that, I had a Mac repair company. And in 2007, I started $300 Data Recovery. And back then, 300 was the rate for every and all drives we received. At that time, we didn't do head swaps or clean room repairs. But we still had a really good success rate and our prices were way more affordable than any other data recovery company. A lot of people want to try to do data recovery at their home, uh, DIY data recovery. And while this can work in, in best case scenarios, there's definitely risks involved. Uh, for example, if your drive has platter damage and you run software, there's a good chance the software is going to keep trying to read this platter damaged area and the platter damage on the drive is going to get bigger and bigger until the drive is either completely dead or it could be increasing the scratch on the platter if there was a scratch or it could just be increasing the number of bad sectors. So one of the major differences between a DIY software and, the, and what we do is we always clone the drive first and skip the bad sectors of the drive. So we try to get as much of the good reading sectors as we can as quickly as possible. Only after we get that do we go back and work on these problem areas. But software that you download for free on the internet can't tell that there's a bad area of the drive. It just keeps trying to recover the same file or sector over and over again. And it doesn't, it, there's no way to limit the extent of the damage it's doing. Whereas we can see exactly where the bad sectors are and avoid them. And just to expand on that, the reason why we're able to image drives much more safely is because we're not connecting the drive to a Windows or Mac machine and running the software on there. Instead, we have special hardware that we connect the drive to. Now, this hardware talks to the drive directly and can control many of the features and functions of the drive uh, so that we can specifically change aspects of the drive in order to make it read more smoothly. And if you're using Windows or Mac uh, to connect the drive to your computer, the operating system is effectively the communicator between the drive and the software you're running. Whereas our hardware speaks to the drive directly. The problem with this, uh, this kind of hardware for a home user is that it's prohibitively expensive, thousands of dollars uh, at least, and can go up over $10,000. The other thing that our hardware lets us do is is work with the firmware on the drive now that's something that consumer level software can never access at all and especially on the seagate drives or western digital drives it's really important before you really work with the damaged drive at all not only do you back up the firmware on the drive in case it gets worse you can revert it back but also we're disabling a lot of background tasks that the drive is running always. So a Seagate drive may always be trying to look for and relocate bad sectors on the drive. This is adding extra movement to the heads. So if you're running your software and it's trying to recover a file in a platter damaged area, not only are the heads trying to read that platter damaged area, they're also trying to read the firmware area on the drive because it's running background scans. 
So that's a really important distinction between what we do and what a home user can do. So I'm just gonna walk you through some of the specialized hardware tools we use for data recovery. So this guy is a BGA rework station. We use this in flash and SSD recoveries. Um, what it does is it heats the metal portions of a PCB like a, for a flash drive so that we can remove the chips safely without heating the chips themselves too much, which can damage and lead to data loss. We can also use this for trying to reflow SSDs in certain cases. Um, basically, the solder just needs to be heated up a bit in order for the drive to work again for long enough that we can image it. And these are some of the special PCBs we use for Western Digital um, USB to SATA conversions. Um, like this is a new Western Digital family called Charger, which is actually locked down at the firmware level. So it's, it's very difficult to recover these right now. We have one PCB that's unlocked which allows us to access the firmware on these drives. I don't even know if there's really any other company in the US right now that has one of these. This is our ROM programmer. So we use this to read uh, the ROM chips. So we put this little ROM chip on a reader like this, and then plug this in here, and then we read it like that. This is kind of our main SCSI and SAS machine. Um, inside here, you can see a SCSI card, but then there's also uh, an SAS card and there's the PC3000 SCSI SAS. So this allows us to work with um, up to four SCSI drives at a time. And we also have the RAID add-on so we can relatively easily rebuild SCSI and SAS raids. And then over here, this is our kind of soldering hot air station area. So this is our hot air gun, microscope, and soldering iron. And then here we just have a, a second little super tiny clean room. This is, we don't really do any major repairs. This is more so that I can inspect drives in this room without going over to the clean room in the other room, which is always in use. So these are four DeepSpar disk imagers. Um, this is just a, this is the card in here. And then we have a drive we're cloning to this drive is saving the deep spark configuration data and this is the bad drive and here we have another one the only difference on this one is it has the ata expander card which increases speeds so typically if someone chooses our priority service for rush turnaround we'll put it on one of these two machines because they both have the ata card it, it makes things about 10 or 20 percent faster and this is uh, another deep spar this one actually has the usb add-on so like yesterday i just finished a four terabyte western digital usb c drive on here luckily i didn't have to convert it to a sata pcb over here we have some more ddis deep spar disk imagers this is our second one with the USB add-on, so we have two of those. This is just a regular old DeepSpar. And this is our DeepSpar with the PCI add-on. So we can do um, any, any SSD that has this kind of interface or this kind of interface. So PCIe M.2, I believe. This is another one of our PC3000s. This is uh, an Express. It has four ports, so we can work with four drives at a time. And this is another of the same uh, PC3000 Express, four ports. 
This one also has our uh, the RAID add-on. So we have the SCSI with the RAID add-on, and we have a regular with the RAID add-on. And I forgot to mention this one has the SSD add-on. So this is where we do all of our SSD recoveries. Here's some of the computers we use to move data. So after we clone the drive to one of our um, good drives, we bring it into this room, scan the clone, and then move the data to the customer's transfer drive, and then we also back up the data. Is this a key element in data recovery? <laughs> I think Is it's... that one of your tools? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a continuation of the last room with maybe four more computers. And then this is also our main clean room area where Aaron's doing all the head swaps, platter swaps, and head unstick issues, as well as inspecting drives. Um, any new drive that comes in, for example, with an open cover, we always inspect it first. So we um, have a very large inventory of donor parts that we use for data recovery. Um, so some are over here. Uh, oh, wow, that's a lot of hard drives. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. And it goes around there, and then we have more in here. Um, so there's some more donor drives over here. And then we have even more in an overflow section now. We're basically getting too many at this point, but this is our overflow section. Yeah, so our, our average turnaround time is about five to seven or eight days. It could be way shorter, it could be longer, it depends. Um, if your drive just has a minor firmware issue and we're able to image it, you know, that may only take a day and you'll get your data back in a couple of days. Um, we also offer a priority service, which is $50 up front and $150 extra if successful. And with that, you know, front of the line for everything, we try to get it out in one or two days and sometimes it's same day. I think one reason that we're able to charge so much less than other data recovery companies is because we have a really efficient workflow. Um, so, you know, when I started this, it was just me. I built it from the ground up. And as we've grown, we've grown our system uh, in order to, to help us work most efficiently and effectively. So, um, yeah, everything is custom. All of our software is custom made for our workflow. Listen, that was great. I really appreciate uh, your generosity in sharing the wealth of information and experience that you have. And um, if anybody has any questions about data recovery, please leave it in the comments below this video, and then we'll address those on a future date. Perfect. Wonderful. Love to. Well, keep doing the good work, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks, Gary. Thank you again. Have a good one. You too. This looks like the International Space Station. <laughs> this is an old SAS bridge that we used before we got the PC-3000. So if you want to buy this, carry this is for sale. <laughs> All right. It's exactly what I needed. <laughs> I'm not sure you're waiting for me to go first. Start again. Get it one more time. <laughs> Is it me or is the sun hasn't moved at all since we started this? Red light's still on? 